So this is the second one of these that I'm going to do. The idea is that this is somehow between a television interview and a lecture. It's what's on my mind today, and in sharing it with you, I'm helping to think it out for myself. The, the first time we did this, I was talking about how the Russian campaign to elect Donald Trump worked. What I'd like to do today is turn things around, look at it from the other direction, and ask why we were so receptive. Because, of course, the problem is, if you start from the Russians, you can end up with the idea that they are gods and geniuses. And, of course, what they did was interesting, and it was impressive. It is interesting and impressive that they managed to turn an American electoral campaign into an international cyber contest. It's even more interesting that they managed to win it. And as we get our minds around the particular things that they actually did, that they hacked emails and released them at a time that would help one candidate over another, that they used bots to spread millions or billions of messages to Americans, that they had their own Facebook and Twitter presence, which millions of Americans followed, unwittingly, and which Americans took as their own, made into their own, internalized, and then started to say, started to speak aloud. All of this is incredibly interesting. And then, of course, when it dawns on us that in 2016, Russian polit politicians and even Russian intelligence officers were speaking openly about Trump as their candidate, and that when at the end, Russian politicians rejoice openly that their guy has won, this is shocking. And one of the natural responses to the shock is to say, okay, that was them. They're guilty. We are innocent. And that's perfectly understandable. And you get hit in the gut, you naturally blame the person who hits you in the gut. But then there's the question of why your gut was so soft and inviting in the first place. And that's the question that I'm going to try to address today. Now, the way that I'm going to do it is to think about how America looks from the outside it can be very helpful to look at yourself from the perspective of an other. And sometimes it's even more helpful if the other is hostile, as Russia was towards the United States in 2016, because the hostile other, that particular perspective, can reveal the weaknesses about you, which perhaps are the very things that you overlook. Another way to consider this question is to think, why did, why did this work? And not only why did this work, why did it work better than the Russians itself thought they were going to work? And I think the answer to that question is that the United States, although this is uncomfortable for us, is in several important respects more like the Russian Federation than perhaps we would really like. So what are, what are those respects? I'm going to spend a little time talking about three of them. The first is the media. The second is the political system. And the third is social inequality. So. The Russian attack on the United States took place primarily through the media, and it gives us a chance to ask what has actually happened to our media in the last decade. In fact, even the fact that I'm using the word media, and you're all nodding your heads, media, media, we're thinking media, we use the word media, that itself reveals the basic problem. Because what has happened is that we've, we've shifted from being a country where there were lots of regional and local newspapers which provided you know, an imperfect, but nevertheless a shaded, a variegated, a specific view of, of daily life to people, we've shifted from that into something else. We've shifted from that into this, into this place where we think there's one media, and then we're for it or against it or whatever. I mean something very specific here. A decade ago, the United States still had a great deal more local press than it did now. In the late 2000s, the local press began to suffer. After the financial crisis of 2008, roughly 40 newspaper men and women were laid off every day on average in 2009. By 2010, the industry had basically cratered. Now, why does this matter so much? Why does it matter that there's not a local newspaper here or a regional newspaper there? It means that people shift from thinking of journalism as something which is done by people whom they know because they see them at the city council meeting or they see them at the PTO or whatever it might be, people shift from that idea that journalism is about life to another idea, which is that there's not really journalism. There's just the media. There's television. And there are the networks. And what do the networks cover? And this is important. The networks cover international news. They cover things that happen on the coasts. They cover DC. They cover New York. They cover Los Angeles. If you're in Oklahoma and you're watching one of the networks, your face appears pretty much only when there's a natural disaster. Now that's a slight exaggeration, but it gets towards an important truth, which is that when you clear away the local news, 
what you're doing is you're opening the way for the fake news. Because if journalism starts to become the media, it starts to become something distant and abstract, something which is not really about you, you're only one step away from beginning to believe the things which really aren't true, right? If, if news becomes distant, then the next step is that news becomes fake. Now, why is it, what does it have to do with Russia? Because amazingly, the same thing happened in Russia just a few years before. There's also not local news in Russia. There's also not regional news in Russia. The way Russian news works is that everything is huddled around a few television stations, and the television stations give Russians all across this massive country an idea of who the enemies and the friends are, an idea of what the conspiracies are supposed to be. We're not there yet, but it's striking how getting rid of the local news makes us just a little bit more like Russia than perhaps we think we are, which leads us to the second problem, which is television itself. Now, the way that Mr. Trump worked was as a fictional character. As I was trying to talk about last time, there is no Mr. Trump successful businessman. That person never walked the earth. There is Mr. Trump successful entertainer. There is Mr. Trump purveyor of spectacle. And in 2015 and well into 2016, this was very attractive to the major television networks. Today, Mr. Trump complains unceasingly about them and says that they're sources of fake news and so on. But if it weren't for the couple billion dollars in free coverage that they gave him in 2015 and 2016, he never would have had a chance. And this has to do with a basic American problem that starting in about the 80s, we began to confuse news with entertainment. We, we merged the two. Um, and again, you might ask, what does this have to do with Russia? Again, Russia shows us where things go if you take, it, if you take them to their logical extreme. What the Russians did in the 2000s was they took our models. Um, they took CNN and especially Fox, and they pushed them to a logical extreme. It's sad to say it, but RT basically represents, or TV Canal basically represents things that we do, but with higher production values and a much higher gradient of fiction, and of course with no, scrupul no scruples and no journalistic integrity whatsoever. But nevertheless, the model of merging news and entertainment is ours. The Russians just took it to its logical extreme, where the news fades completely away and only entertainment matters. And from that kind of a world, and that kind of a world, a Donald Trump is natural. From a Russian point of view, a figure like Donald Trump is absolutely normal. For us, there's still a little bit of static around the edges because we haven't quite convinced ourselves that there's no such thing as news. But Russia shows us what comes next. The third problem with the media then has to do with the internet itself, which has emerged in our lives with so much fanfare and so much happy talk that it's very difficult for us to confront the, the, the possibility that maybe the internet just makes, it, makes us stupider than, than, than the alternative. It's like, it's almost a grammatical error to say that in English because there's been, there's been 20 years of so much happy talk around this invention. But let's consider the way the internet actually works with respect to, to the news. What the internet tends to do is break events down to the smallest possible unit of attention that can bear an advertisement, which means that our attention gets broken up into these tiny little bits, and the tiny little bits might not be enough to actually think about politics. They might tempt us into thinking that, for example, a political entertainer is the same thing as a presidential candidate. The other thing that the internet does, which is much more interesting from a Russian point of view, is that the internet draws us in we, we, when we look at the screen, we have the impression that we're in control, that we're the ones doing the clicking, that we're the ones doing the reading. But the, the internet, it's, it sounds crazy. It sounds like Stephen King or George Orwell, and it is. Um, but the internet knows much more about you than you know about it. Your interaction with the internet is giving the internet and its platforms information, which allows the internet to spin things back to you, which seem right to you, which feel good to you. You get drawn in. And as you get drawn in, you lose the ability to distinguish between what feels good to you and what is actually true. Now, that's incredibly important from a Russian point of view because all confidence operations, all attempts to use another country against itself, another society against itself, depend precisely on that. They depend precisely on trust. So the way that Russian disinformation over the internet functioned was precisely that they first figured out what people wanted to hear and then they gave them more of it, and more of it, and more of it, until past some imperceptible point, people were no longer just influenced by a Russian operation. 
they were a Russian operation because the things that they said in real life, the things that they said in, in the bright light of day were actually things that they had gotten from Russians, but they just didn't know that this was the case. So in all, in all of these ways, this American media environment, which we take to be our own, looks a bit Russian, or from, a, from, a, from the perspective of people trying to harm us, it looks like one big attack surface. The second source of weakness, or the second source of vulnerability in the United States, had to do with our political system. And I, I, I spent a little time on, on this last time, but I want to develop it. The things that look to us like div divisions from an outside perspective can look like weaknesses or fractures that can be further opened. The things to us that look like our, 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 our particular constitutional heritage from the outside can look like levers that can be pushed to make that constitutional order fall apart. So what do I have in mind? The first thing that I have in mind is, is the racial divide. If we look back at 2016, there were two stories that were unfolding side by side, and I suspect very much that they were linked. One of these stories was the partisan story of Republicans making the case that Mr. that Mr. Obama was not a legitimate president, that he did not have the right, for example, to name a Supreme Court justice. In domestic news, that's the main story, I think, of 2016. In, in foreign news, the main story of 2016 is the Russian cyber war. And what I suspect is that the two of these things are linked together. That the Russians, looking at the way we are fighting over race, see an opportunity. This all comes to a head in September of 2016, when Mitch McConnell, who's of course um, the, the, the Republican leader of the Senate, says that he would regard a response to the Russian cyber attack as a partisan attack against the Republicans. In other words, defending American sovereignty is understood in partisan terms. Now, it's not a guess to say that the Russians are aware of our racial divides. If you look at the fake internet sites, the fake social media sites that Russia, that Russia designed, a very large percentage of them have to do precisely with um, informing whites that blacks are a threat, saying that it's legitimate for the police to shoot blacks, and then at the same time also trying to radicalize black opinion. So it seems to me that this, that this, that this issue, which we take to be very much ours, this issue of, of racism, of whites and blacks, from, from an external point of view, looks like an attack surface. The same thing is true of our curious constitutional system. We take for granted that there's an electoral college, that there's gerrymandering, that there's endless money in politics, that there are voter suppression laws. If we see them as problems at all, we think of those as our problems. But what those things did in 2016 was set up a situation where Mr. Trump just had to win in a few very important states in order to win the entire elections. And he knew which states those were, and the Russians knew which states those were. And this all comes together in the fact that the Russian internet campaign was focused most intensively on the particular states that Mr. Trump had to win. And then he won them. The third way that we are like Russia, and therefore vulnerable to Russia, maybe the one that goes the deepest and, and which is the hardest for us to see, and therefore maybe the most revealing to try to understand, and that has to do with, with inequality. Now, let's think back to a moment to 1989. Let's think back to the end of communism, and let's think back to the great mistake that we made then, um, the great trick that we played upon ourselves. When communism came to an end in 1989 in Europe, or when the Soviet Union came to an end in 1999, what Americans said was, aha, the communist story is wrong. It's not true that there will be a Marxist utopia in the future. Okay, fair enough, there won't be. But what we also told ourselves was, therefore, our story is right. And what was our story? Our story was something like, in the 1980s, Thatcher, Reagan, our story was something like, Capitalism leads to democracy, and therefore the more capitalism or the more unregulated capitalism, the more democracy we're going to get. What was the problem with that story? The problem with that story is that it generated tremendous inequality, and that that inequality made the United States much more like Russia than we might have expected. What happens in Russia is that uh, early attempts to reform communism fail, 
oligarch sees most of the wealth, and then Mr. Putin, at the head of one oligarchical clan, is able to concentrate wealth in the hands of himself and a few other people. And this happens relatively quickly. It leads to a situation where 1% of the Russian population controls about 87% of Russian wealth. In the US, this story is a little more complicated. We play this experiment on ourselves where we say, okay, what happens if you imagine that capitalism is the same thing as democracy? What happens if you make it harder to unionize? What happens if, if you stop implementing a welfare state with all of the normal things that comparable countries have, like parental leave and vacations and health care and pensions and good public education? What happens if you punt on all of that and just imagine that the market will take care of it? What happens is that Worker productivity increases, but worker salaries do not increase. What happens is that wealth concentrates in the hands of the wealthiest Americans. So that when you get to 2015, 2016, one percent of the American population controls about 76 percent of American wealth. You could cite a whole bunch of numbers, but the picture, the stratification, is striking because where you land is that the only country in the world that begins to challenge Russia in terms of economic inequality is precisely the United States of America. So in a very broad way, that makes us suspect that Russian politics should work here. If they got to incredible inequality first, and they have their own way of dealing with it, why wouldn't that way of dealing with it work here? And there's another story which is maybe even a bit more sinister, which is the way that American unregulated capitalism and Russian oligarchy work together. And this is something that the Paradise Papers, if you happen to be reading them, helps us to see even more clearly. The way that Russian oligarchs accumulated their money was, first, you steal it from your own country. Second, you put it in some offshore site. And third, you launder it into dollars or euros or something else. To be more specific, what Russian oligarchs generally did was, very often did was, they used anonymous companies in the United States. Because in the US, remember, on regulated capitalism, you can actually found a company anonymously. In Delaware, there's one building that has 280,000 anonymous companies registered to its address. So you, you use, the, um, use the United States of America as an offshore site. And then what else do you do? Um, you buy American real estate. About a third of the purchases of top-end real estate in major American cities now are likely used to launder money, much of it from, from Russia. So in this general way, our own unsupervised capitalism allows the Russian oligarchy to form. And this is also a very particular story. So if you think back to Mr. Trump himself, how is Mr. Trump rescued? He's rescued by Russia. He exists as a person. The figure of a successful businessman can only arise because Russians use his properties to launder their money. Even more down into the details, in June of 2016, when members of the Trump campaign meet with Russians to discuss how they're going to use information that Russia has on Clinton to hurt the Clinton campaign, one of the participants at that meeting is precisely a Russian financier who specializes in creating anonymous companies in the United States to launder Russian money. So the United States helped Russia become what it is. And much more specifically, Mr. Trump was in the middle of that interaction. If you have unregulated, unsupervised capitalism, it creates transnational cosmopolitan figures like Mr. Trump, who can then serve one country against another, which is, which is, where, we have, which is where we finally landed. Now, that's how it looks from above. That's how America and Russian oligarchy comes together, or if you like, Russo-American kleptocracy comes together in a certain figure. But how does it look from below? One of the very intelligent things that Mr. Trump said during the campaign was that the American dream was dead. He had his mind around something. Um, what he had his mind around was a very real phenomenon. As wealth concentrates at the top, social, mo social mobility becomes very difficult. So, um, we now know, there are studies on this, that if you were born in 1940, you had about a 90% chance of doing better than your parents. If you're born in 1984, your chances go down to about 50, and it only gets worse after that. Right now, most Americans think that their children will do worse than they will, and unfortunately, they're probably right. In that particular situation, where social mobility seems impossible, new forms of politics um, come into being. Politics which are nostalgic about the past, 
politics which encourage conflict in the present, politics which take that dead American dream and they create a kind of zombie march instead where everyone is against everyone else all the time. This is what happened in Russia. This is what happened in Russia first. There's no such thing as social mobility in Russia. And so Russian politics becomes a constant question of friend and enemy, Russia versus America. And now look, look what's happening with us, with our election of Trump, with the way Trump actually governs. Nobody, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, now looks at the federal government and imagines, oh, the federal government is going to create policies for the future. No, we're all caught in this zombie dance where all we do is we're outraged about this thing or that thing or the other thing in the present. We don't expect that the, that the future actually holds something better for us. So in that deep and profound way as well, Russia holds out a model, or if you don't like it, you might consider it to be a warning that you can shift to a situation where a, a, a politics as being reform about the future shifts to politics being conflict all the time about the present. Mr. Trump clearly represents that. He's, he's a vehicle for that. But to conclude, my point is not that it's all the Russians' fault or even that it's all Mr. Trump's fault. It's very hard to change what the Russians are going to do, and it's, it's, it's relatively hard to change what Mr. Trump is going to do. What we can do is reflect on the elements, the fundamental elements of our own society and political system, which makes all of this possible to go in reverse order. Um, this is possible because America has become one of the most unequal countries in the world to the point where many Americans reasonably doubt that the future will be better than the past. That opens the way for politics, which plays on animosities, which plays on outrage, which reduces everything to a day-to-day -day contest between friends and enemies. The Russians are very good at that, and Mr. Trump following them is also very good at that. We are vulnerable to this, secondly, because, uh, because a political system allows for certain divides, partisan divides and racial divides, and because a political system creates a possibility to win the presidency of the United States just by winning a few critical states. These are things which are part of us, which only we can change. And finally, uh, where I started, this, this is all possible because of the way we interact with the media around us. Um, I've tried to explain how the internet makes this kind of thing likely. I've tried to explain how TV can turn news into spectacle. I've tried to explain how important it is for there to be newspapers. But at the end of the day, that too depends not on those big media institutions, it depends on us. We can choose to read newspapers and then post what we read on the internet. We can choose to subscribe to newspapers. We can choose to spend more time in real life just trying to figure out how things are going on. So this little extemporaneous talk to you was one of my attempts to try to figure out what's going on. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate your patience. It's very helpful to me. Thanks.